Hey, what's up, friends on YouTube? This one is a YouTube exclusive. As you know, from time to time, I will put out YouTube exclusives that don't make it on my podcast platforms on Spotify or iTunes, and this is one of them. And in just a moment, you're going to see me on stage at our Fit Body Bootcamp World Conference that took place about four weeks ago. And our Fit Body Bootcamp World Conference took place in Dallas. And uh, of course, as you know, I or you may not know, but I actually speak on stage. I'm a paid public speaker. And of course, I went out and I spoke at our Fit Body Bootcamp World Conference, and it was a very customized presentation that I did with you in mind because we had Fit Body Bootcamp owners, we had Fit Body Bootcamp coaches, hundreds of them on hand in Dallas, and I wanted to make a custom presentation, a custom talk that I know would impact them and I know would impact you. So here it is. Enjoy. I want to talk to you guys about what I think are some of the core, three of the core biggest desires that people have. Uh, for me, at 49 years old now, I had a lot of life experience. With life experience comes some level of wisdom. And if I can impart that with you, I'll have done my job right. And what I mean by that is this. I figured out that we're looking for three things in life. We're looking for money, meaning, and self-mastery. And you could write those down, and we're going to break those apart in a second. Now, the reason we're looking for money is because money solves the problem of not having money, right? Your, your bills aren't going to pay themselves. Your good looks will not pay for your bills. If you want to give yourself, your family, an awesome life experience, that ain't going to happen with good looks. It's going to happen with money. You want to have a home. You want to live in a better part of town. You want to eat quality food. You want to be able to not worry about money. Money is the number one cause of divorce. Money is necessary, so make no mistake about it. We are in the business to make money, every single one of us. I also say do a lot of good with it. Money is a weapon for good. Make no mistake about it. And then meaning. We have to have some level of meaning. I mean, how many times have we heard about people that have money that just go off the deep end, man? They just get a high level of stupidity, right? Because they have no meaning. They have no main cause, no purpose. They don't have a, a true North Star. Like, I am going to use my money as a weapon for this cause. There's no meaning to them. Deep down inside, they struggle with anxiety and depression. And by the way, if you want to know what anxiety and depression is, 99% of the time, anxiety and depression is just your conscience knocking on your door and saying, hey, you are living incongruent with the man or woman that you want to be. You have this potential in you. You have this desire deep in your heart, given to you by your creator, but you are living incongruently. You are not doing what you ought to be doing, and we are reminding you in the most painful way possible through anxiety and depression. Now, it is easier to go to a doctor and get medicated for it. The doctor doesn't go, hey, well, by the way, what is your heart's desire? What, is, what did God put you on this earth to do? What is your purpose? They just go, oh, you're suffering from anxiety? Take this. And you have some depression? Let's give you that. That's why every year there's a 400x increase in prescription medication that have to do with anxiety and depression. They are there to treat the symptoms. The source is here in your heart. If we are not living a meaningful life, a life of service to others, a life that's gonna leave our fingerprint on this planet because we are all gonna die, are we not? At best, if mom and dad gave us 100 years of life because they gave us good genetics, they taught us to eat right and work out, we've, we've, we've kept a positive mental attitude, we might have that 100 years. That's gonna go by quick, man. Let me tell you, as I've come to the halfway point of those 100 years, I'm like, holy shit. I've got so much more to do, and I'm 49 right now. What happened? Why was I fucking around? That is a horrible feeling. Now, I can only imagine people who have this desire in their heart to, to serve, to have meaning, to do something, but they're constantly choosing mediocrity over being a fucking savage. It's so easy to choose that, too, because it is literally promoted and it is celebrated to be mediocre. Yet no mom or dad ever tells their child, I want you to grow up and be average. You know, just be of average health, have average education, marry an average person, buy an average house, live an average life, do average things, make average money. 
You would never tell your child that. Yet that's exactly what they model to us. What they tell us is you can do anything you want. People don't care what you say. They do what you do. We are always modeling. We are walking, talking role models. The difference is you're either a cautionary tale or you're an example of great humanity. And so if mom and dad are in debt and they always believe that money is evil, money is bad, they've never talked about money being good, money being a vehicle to freedom and opportunity and to be able to serve humanity, then you grow up thinking that money is for other people. That's how I grew up. Remember, I'm an immigrant to this country. I'm a foreigner. We lived in Section 8 housing. I got to, I had to eat out of dumpsters. Back then, I would hear my dad say, we're always running out of money before we run out of month. We're always running out of money before we run out of month. I grew up with that loop playing in my head. Money must be for people that were born here. Money must be for people that went to college. Money must be for people who didn't live in Section 8 housing. Money's certainly not for me. And understand this, that whatever that you believe, you will find evidence in the world for. And since that was my belief system, that money is not available to us blue collar people, to us foreigners, to us not college educated, to us living in Section 8 housing, I found evidence. I found evidence to justify my beliefs. When I believed that I was just a struggling personal trainer working at an LA Fitness making $12 an hour. By the way, here's how LA Fitness rolled. You get to make $12 an hour, but you have to train two people in that hour. They're 30 minute sessions, yeah. So stay dehydrated because you can't take a piss, right? <laughs> it's like to make your 12 bucks, you gotta literally train one client as you're saying goodbye to one, you're saying hello to the other and taking them back on the floor. They were charging those clients 400, 600, 800 dollars a month, depending on if it was two, three, or four times a week with a personal trainer. I was making 12 dollars an hour. Jim Franco was one of my four personal training clients. So I had to work a job at Disneyland as a busboy and a second job on the weekends as a bouncer at a gay bar. And the reason I worked at a gay bar is because the gay bar paid more than the straight bar. <laughs> True story. Can I tell you guys that story, how that came to be? So there I was, I was a personal trainer, right? LA Fitness, four whopping clients, because I was horrible at selling. Because the whole idea was if we sold someone personal training like $600 a month, it's a six or a 12 month program, they give you 10% commission and then hourly. And so when you have four clients, it really tells you what your closing percentage is, right? <laughs> Shitty, I was the worst closer on the planet. And so I had, uh, during the week I worked at Disneyland, uh, Carnation Cafe on Main Street restaurants. One of only two sit-down restaurants at Disneyland. And then uh, one day I was complaining. So y'all probably don't know this, but Disneyland has the highest population of gay employees of, of any business on the planet. So anyways, back to Bob and Randy. Bob and Randy were a couple. They worked at Disneyland in the in Carnation Cafe with me. Great human beings, love them to pieces. And, one day I'm complaining to Bob. I'm like, Bob, man, this fucking sucks. I've got all these nieces and nephews. In fact, one of my nephews. Michael, you in here? No. Yep. No. There you go. I worked at the gay club for you, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> true story. I'm like, Bob, I've got all these nieces and nephews, man, and the holidays are coming up, and I need another job. Like, between a personal trainer and a, and a busboy here at Disneyland, it ain't paying the bills. He's like, well, you hang out with all of us, F word, right? You hang out with all of us here, so if you're not afraid to hang out with the rest of us there at this bar I go to, I'm like, fuck it, man, show me. He goes, they pay really good. I go, how much? $19 an hour. I'm like, son of a bitch. <laughs> like, let's do it, right? Because I wanted to be a bouncer. I figured, that's, what are you, standing around, listening to music? Gay people jumping up and down, raising the roof, dancing? I could do that, right? I could watch. Are you going to fight? Stop it, don't fight, right? <laughs> That's it. Here's what I didn't know, because I was like, why does a straight bar pay minimum wage, but the gay club is paying $19 an hour? And I quickly figured it out. The second week when I was there, um, there were skinheads that came and they waited in the parking lot two in the morning with baseball bats, lead pipes, chains, 
and they were going to gay bash uh, when the club gave out. And the owner of the club said, hey, those guys are out there. It is up to you guys to make sure every one of our patrons get to their cars safely. I did not sign up for that, to fight skinheads who are fucking weaponized, right? And so after a few months working at Oz, that's what it was called, Oz. It's on the 5 Freeway in Buena Park. Probably not there anymore. Um, I was like, you know, I'm done. And the reason I was done is because Jim Franco, that personal training client of mine, who I would complain to, man, Jim, it's a Monday morning. It's early for me. That's why I'm tired. I didn't get to sleep until 2 a.m. He's like, how are you sleeping at 2 a.m. and then waking up and coming in, in here for your first session at 5 o'clock? Well, Jim, I just have to make it happen, but I'm tired. I, I, I need more money, so I'm working at this gay club as a bouncer. He goes, you know why you don't have money, right, kid? And I said, no, explain. Now, keep in mind, at this point, I'm 23, 24 years old, probably 23. He's in his 60s. I go, why? He goes, well, you fail to understand sales. I go, Jim, I beg to differ. I closed you on personal training. You come in here three times a week for six months. He goes, you didn't close me on anything. You're an order taker. I came in here looking for a personal trainer to train me three times a week. You made the offer. I bought it. You just filled, fulfilled an order. He said, you're no different than a waitress at a restaurant. A hungry person goes with the intention to buy. The waitress doesn't sell them anything. I was like, fuck. And I share that with you because when I told Jim, I said, well, if I didn't, I didn't sell you, then, then I just took an order from you. How do I get better at selling? He goes, I'm going to bring you some books and some cassette tapes tomorrow. And he showed up with books and cassette tapes from Tom Hopkins and, and then Zig Ziglar and Brian Tracy. And I had discovered a whole new world of sales, persuasion, overcoming objections, storytelling. Keep in mind, if you're like, wow, this motherfucker is really good at telling the story, English is a second language for me. I had to learn your language before I can actually draw a word picture for you that you're seeing in your mind's eye right now. And so if you think making money, having meaning, owning a Fit Body Boot Camp, owning multiple locations is impossible, it's not. I literally went from getting beat up by gangsters, gangbangers, eating out of dumpsters, having my hair washed with gasoline, true story as well. My mom had my dad siphon out gasoline from a parked car because we couldn't afford to buy lice treatment. Uh, one of the apartments that we lived in was just riddled with lice. I got lice. My mom washed my hair with, with gasoline because we couldn't afford lice treatment. And the life I live today is literally a Cinderella life. It's freaking nuts. With this life comes a lot of pressure, but as Tim Grover says, this pressure is a privilege. You know, I'm sitting back there in the green room, still nervous, still sweating. Been speaking for 11 years. I get paid 50 grand to speak from stage. Every penny of that $50,000 goes to Shriners Children's Hospital. The entire industry knows not to negotiate with my speaking fee because they're taking money from children who need surgeries. Yet I still sit in the green room nervous because I'm an introvert in an extrovert's world. So the creator does have a sense of humor. He does. Like, all right, we're gonna, you're gonna be born an introvert, but we're gonna put you in the extrovert's world and you're gonna be, you're gonna be doing crazy things like speaking from stage and looking into the camera just by yourself and a podcast. I'm like, no, I just wanna interview someone. No, no, you did that for three or four years with, with the Empire Show. You gotta go solo, it's all you. I'm like, I don't wanna do it. For five months, I, fight, I fought the resistance between the Empire Show and the BK Show. There was five months of no shows. Just one day, the Empire Show stopped. And I felt called to start speaking to humanity, to start helping men wake up, to realize that sovereignty and masculinity is okay. It's healthy, it's what's needed. And we are that line that the opposition is trying to cross in order to get control and compliance over the masses. I'm like, there's too many people out there doing that. I don't need to do this. Let them do it. I took five months negotiating with myself. In those five months is when I experienced the highest level of anxiety and depression. Because I felt, at this point, Bryce is at the helm of Fit Body Boot Camp. 
So he's running the day-to-day -day at Fitbody. So while I'm still part of Fitbody Bootcamp, I'm not in the trenches with them doing this. That sense of purpose left me. I've got a great team at Trulene. They're rocking it. There's no, no, nothing I could do there. The Empire Show was what I was doing. It would give me a sense of purpose to fulfill my calling. And then I just stopped. And for five months, I renegotiated and renegotiated with myself. And for those five months, anxiety and depression was the highest for me. And one day I told Joan, hey, Joan, I envisioned this black background with the logo and just gold uplighting and one microphone and one camera that I could look down. She's like, okay, done. I'll have the studio fixed in three weeks. It's like, shit, here we go. And it was literally, hey guys, welcome to the Empire Show. It is now the Bedros Cooling Show. This is episode 2000, uh, 210 for the Empire Show, but episode one for the Bedros Cooling Show. If you're wondering what happened to the Empire Show, I didn't even say goodbye. I just disappeared five months ago, and here I am now. And all the while in the back of my head, I'm thinking, no one is gonna watch this on YouTube or listen to it on the podcasts. We put the first episode out and boom, it just blows up 20,000 views on YouTube in three days. Within two weeks, over 150,000 views. On the podcast platforms, it blows up. Just to give you something to compare against, The Empire Show, our best episodes, would get 4,000 views after like six or seven months on YouTube. And The Empire Show was like number 15 or 16 in business development. Now I'm top five in personal development on the podcast platforms and literally one of the fastest growing YouTube channels on the planet. We're adding a thousand new subscribers a day organically. No ads, no nothing. Every episode pops off. And I share this with you because when you were called to do something and you don't, you start negotiating your way out of it. You start kicking that can down the road. Well, it has to be perfect. So I'll make sure we have the logo and the brand and the background and let me do the research. Just launch, just launch. And you will have the greatest sense of money and meaning. And that is vital to us, man, as humans. Absolutely vital. And here's the cool thing about it. None of you are islands operating by yourself. You probably have a mom or a dad. You probably have siblings. You probably have a significant other. You have your person. You, you, you have kids. There's people watching you. We're role models. Like it or not, you're a role model. And so understand that the business that we're in, guys, I, I was so wrong. I thought I was in the business of fitness. I thought I was in the business of helping people get fit. We're not. I'm in the business of helping change lives. I'm in the business of saving lives. I'm in the business of saving marriages. I'm in the business of saving businesses. You are in those businesses. Because fitness is the gateway drug to a better human. That third component that we're going to talk about, self-mastery, whoo, that's the magic formula. Self-mastery, your higher self. Because I believe we are all born as human animals. And that's by design. A child, a baby, a toddler has to be selfish. The human animal is very selfish. The human animal is selfish, it's greedy, it's emotional. It does things when it feels like it because it doesn't have impulse control. The human being is someone that has, has evolved. The human being is connected to consciousness. The human being, on the other hand, is selfless. The human being understands that I have to be kind, that I have to serve humanity, I can't be selfish. It is only then when we evolve, transcend, connect to consciousness, tapped in, that we start seeing the world as though it's a movie. I literally feel like this shell that I'm living in, the human animal, I'm consciousness stuck in a human animal. Let me just explain it that way. And my eyes are the windows, and I'm witnessing everything. And so when it was 1.30 in the morning and I'm driving through Georgia, and the human animal's like, fuck this, 
this sucks, text Bryce, let him know, pull over, buy something sweet and eat it because I'm an emotional eater. When my emotions go high, I eat. I don't drink, I don't snort coke. I eat, I will out eat anybody. And I don't eat like, oh, is that chicken breast? Let me have it. It's bagels, I'll break a bagel in half and dip it in the whipped Philadelphia cream cheese and eat it standing at the counter because humans eat at the table. Animals eat at the counter, right there with the fridge, the fridge open behind me. And we, have, we, my family, we have one of those fancy fridges now because I'm rich. So after like a minute and a half, it goes beep, 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 beep. And I don't give a fuck if it's beeping or not because I've got bagels and I got two tubs of cream cheese, right? That's the human animal. But those days are long gone. It's been years since I've done that. But make no mistake about it, when you're tired, when you're hungry, when you're exhausted and you're driving, you know you got three states you gotta drive through to get to a destination. The negotiation begins. We always negotiate. The difference is I used to let the inner critic win. Now I give more power to the inner advocate. Like, dude, imagine if Andrew and Chloe are sitting in the back seat of this fucking car that keeps trying to keep you in the lane. How would they feel if you're like, hey guys, so we're just gonna text Bryce now and tell him that we're not gonna make it to the, to the mastermind. And you can justify it. Like, you know, guys, we're eight hours late to the flight, we missed the flight, we missed the other flight, we tried, here we are, we're South Carolina, let's just call it a day, we did the best we could, let's catch a flight and go back. I always picture that my kids are in the back seat, they're with me, they're backstage watching. And because of that, I'm role modeling the highest version of myself. And when I role model the highest version of myself often enough, that soft habit becomes a fixed habit. Now I have no choice. I see escalators and stairs, I just take stairs. I see a parking spot up here up front and I see a parking spot way in the back, I just park in the back. If you and I are sitting at lunch, breakfast, dinner, it doesn't matter where we're sitting, and the food comes out, I'm just gonna hold conversation and wait for you to take the first bite. You don't even know that we're competing, but we are. <laughs> Do you understand I was a fat, lazy, immigrant, foreigner, broke, human animal? That's who you're talking to right now. That version of me still exists, and it came out on that drive. I'm like, no, man, you're not gonna buy any ding-dongs and ho-hos. People probably watch your shit, and they're gonna be like, dude, you keep eating those, you're gonna have titties that I can milk, right? <laughs> Apparently that's what I'm known for now on, on social media. Like, oh, I love when you talk about how a man has, you know, if he has titties that you can milk, then you're not a man. It's like, did you get anything else out of that episode? <laughs> because I recall it being like a 48-minute episode. You surely got something else out of that other than you can milk a man, right? <laughs> well, yeah, the other thing I got is like uh, Cheeto dust in the belly button. Did you get anything else out of that, right? <laughs> but I get a little worked up, I get excited, and I start, start talking about titties that you can milk and Cheeto dust in the belly button. But in that moment, as I'm driving, I'm like, don't be that guy, man. Don't be that guy. And so it's so cool to see consciousness and the human animal fighting. And every time, consciousness wins now. There was a time that every time the human animal won. And I could justify it because, fuck, it's the pandemic, right? Even during the pandemic, I didn't eat my emotions. I started drinking a little bit more than I should, but I didn't eat my emotions because that's my Achilles heel. Like no, no worse than being in the fitness industry and then going, fuck, man, I can only make videos from the chin up, <laughs> right? That's just the reality. Like, I chose a really bad industry to be an emotional leader. Like I should have been like a fucking chef or something. Like I started off as a bus boy. I could have just kept going that path. Said so I'm like, no, I think I really want to help people get fit and healthy. Stupid. <laughs> Best decision I ever made. But understand, man, that we are not, we are not, not, not just fitness professionals, just personal trainers. We're better than doctors. We're better than lawyers. We're better than accountants. We're better than everybody out there because we are prevention. We're the cure to anxiety. We're the cure to depression. We're the cure because fitness is the gateway drug. You know that. And if you are a fitness professional, a fit body owner, a fit body coach, a fit body front desk person, if you are a facility leader and you got a few pounds to lose, hop to it, baby girl. Because if you don't, 
You were not representing the brand or yourself in a congruent manner. I don't care how much you try and suck it in. And I know they make Spanx for men now, fellas. That doesn't mean we should wear them. We must operate congruently. I always just assume there's a camera on me and my, my son and daughter have a live feed of every minute of every minute of every minute of me. And if you operate like that, the person who you never want to let down has a live feed of you every minute of every minute. Oh shit, dad's about to walk. Oh shit, escalator and stairs. Chloe, watch this. Oh fuck, he took the stairs again. Right? because they want to take the escalator. And they do, and they're athletic and good for them. I got fat jeans, what do I do, right? They got mom's jeans, good for them. I love that. Guys, but you have to understand that all of life is about money, meaning, and self-mastery. And I tell you this because if you start making a lot of money and you're like, ah, I don't need to do self-mastery. Yes, you do, because you won't have that money for long. I've been around long enough as an entrepreneur 22 years to know and to see not only from firsthand experience, but if you don't have money, or if you have money, but you don't have a meaningful life, you're still gonna be suffering. You're gonna be suffering in silence. You're gonna be white knuckling through life because you've got money, but you've got no sense of meaning and purpose, and you're gonna be anxious and depressed. What's the point of money if you are not happy? And if you don't have self-mastery, you're not gonna keep that money long, I promise you. Self-mastery is discipline. Self-mastery is focus. Self-mastery is consistency. Self-mastery is serotonin and not dopamine. Dopamine is when we're scrolling through the, through the iPhone, screen sucking and watching things. Oh, it feels good. You got a dopamine hit. It's when I would crack open a bagel and eat it one after another. Dopamine hit. Alcohol, drugs, vape, pornography, all of that dopamine hits. Binge watching television to escape your reality. All dopamine hits. For a moment, I feel good about life. It's an escape. You know what serotonin is? Starting something long term and finishing it. And then maintaining it. No one talks about serotonin. Everyone talks about dopamine. Serotonin is the absolute feel good drug. It is when you have a baby and you raise that baby into a toddler elementary school, high school, and they launch into humanity, and they are an asset, not a liability. That is serotonin. It is when you decide that you're gonna to commit to building a business, and you sign that lease, and you build out that location, you build the team, you run the marketing, and every step of the way, every step of the way, the bear shows up in your life the fuck is the bear, B? So let me tell you about the bear. The bear and the dragon. You can write this down. We all have a bear and a dragon in our life. The bear is external resistance. The bear shows up when you're signing a lease and that landlord gives you a different uh, contract than the LOI. The bear shows up when you hire someone, train them, and two days before you open the doors, they quit. The bear shows up when you run out of financial runway before you projected to run out because the contractor and everything else cost more and took longer. The bear shows up when the city says, ah, 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 conditional use permit. We need a, see if you can, you need a conditional use permit. It's going to take us six weeks for us to do that little study to see if there's enough parking spots. Motherfucker, I can count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's gonna take you guys six weeks to count if there's enough spots between me and Happy Nails next door. <laughs> what the fuck, right? No, 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 we need to give you a conditional use permit. Or what? Or you can't run a boot camp there. But I signed a lease. Mm -hmm. That's the bear. That's the bear. The bear is there to go, do you really want it? And how bad do you want it? And what are you doing to get it and keep it? All external resistance is bear. And without the bear, we'll never get it. Just know that. The creator knew what he was doing. When he puts the bear in front of us over and over again, it is like resistance in the gym. It is the battle ropes. It is the sled. It is the kettlebells. We develop our physical muscles. We need to develop resiliency, resourcefulness. 
Those muscles, mental toughness, emotional discipline, decisiveness, those muscles are only developed when the bear comes to visit. This is why people that just win the lottery, you're in there buying your Red Bull and a can of Monster and some, a, a bag of Cheetos to wa wash it all down with and like, fuck it, Powerball, $300 million, let's do this. And oh, fuck, I just won $300 million. Within two years, you're broke. Why is it that 82% of people that win the lottery are broke within two years? Because they didn't get to that money while experiencing different levels of bear. They don't have the muscles to maintain that money, to keep that money. They didn't earn that money, you see. The bear is constantly testing you at every level. New levels, new devils, write that down. New levels, new devils, I got my own devils. And let me tell you what happens when you think that like, oh man, I'm in a place in life where I shouldn't have to deal with the bear, this sucks. You guys wanna know what happens? Let me tell you what happens. The universe listens, the creator listens. When you, when you start feeling sorry and you feel pity for yourself, the universe listens. True story though, March 6th, 16th, we announced that we're gonna flatten the curve. This is a death virus, this is it, this is the one. And as we're doing things behind the scenes to make sure that if it's not, if we don't reopen, that we have some solutions for your clients and for yourselves. You know, March goes into April, April goes into May. Right around the end of May, as we started to lose Fit Body locations, some owners just couldn't stay shut. They couldn't stay shut and maintain that. Their landlords were charging them rent. Their overhead was just too much. So they shut down. I get it. And as I'm seeing this, I'm seeing in my mind's eye, I'm seeing my whole identity, what I clawed to build for 20 years collapse around me is what it felt like, felt like, because the human animal feels shit. It felt that way. And so end of May, while having my third cocktail, it was vodka and pineapple juice, I tell Diana, I'm like, hey, this freaking sucks. This freaking sucks. Like, what else can go wrong? Like, what else can go wrong? This pandemic, we're losing money. We haven't brought on any new Fit Body locations. Locations are now shutting down left and right. What else can go wrong? This sucks. I had pity. I felt bad for myself. I felt bad for myself. And then come June, first week of June, we, we ran class five of the project. Hour number 36 of the project a dude dies, boom, right there in BK Strength, in my gym where we're running the project. I asked the universe, what else can go wrong? I started to feel like a victim. This sucks, we're closing down locations, we're losing locations, no new locations are coming on board. Pity me, what else can go wrong? And the creator says, here's what else, motherfucker. Rick Spoon can fall over and die. All of a sudden, as we're pumping on his chest, all I'm thinking to myself is, if there's any way he can come back, I'm willing to lose everything, everything, if we can get this guy back. He didn't come back. I'm not saying I was complicit in that, but I did say what else can go wrong. So never feel sorry for yourself. Never ask what else can go wrong. You just stay in the fight. When you die, you'll know, because you're no longer fighting. Just stay in the fight. The bear is outside, outside resistance. And so that means we've got the dragon left. And what is that dragon? It is the internal resistance. It is what happened to you as a kid. I was molested as a kid for two years between the ages of four and six by two older boys. That left me a lot of mental and emotional trauma. I never, I never healed through that process. Not until I was 35 years old and started working with a therapist. I carried the weight of that, and it showed up in ugly ways in my life. The dragon is all of the things, the way you self-sabotage, those self-limiting beliefs, that you were told that you're, you, you just have, you have bad genetics, you're always gonna be fat. You're not that smart. You're not that good looking. Everything internal is dragon. When you learn to master the dragon and fight through the bear, you have mastered life, my friends. And mastering the dragon means doing the self-work, doing the work that you gotta do even when you don't feel like it. 
even when your emotions tell you not to, even when you begin to negotiate and the inner critic comes out and says, don't, and here's why, and it actually makes sense not to get out of bed and do it, still do it. Let the inner advocate take over. I'm gonna do it anyway, I'm just not gonna do it with a smile. I'm gonna work out, but I'm not gonna do it with a smile. I'm gonna eat right, but I'm not gonna do it with a smile. In fact, I'm gonna do this under protest. I'm gonna drive all the way to that fucking mastermind in North Carolina under protest. Because I know there's a hidden camera in here and there's a live feed, Andrew and Chloe are watching. So fuck this, I can't even eat some ding-dongs and ho-hos because there's a camera in here. Like that's how you gotta operate. And guess what? When I walked into that room in North Carolina and everyone's happy to see me and I'm happy to see them, like my people, all of that that happened last 20 some odd hours was worth it, absolutely worth it. I did nothing under protest. I did everything with absolute enthusiasm from that minute forward when I walked in through those double doors. So I'm here to tell you that some things you will have to do under protest even when you don't feel like it, even when your emotions tell you not to, even when it's cold, you didn't sleep well, it hurts. Do it anyway, yes? yes. yes. Thank you, my job here is done, love you guys. <laughs>